Slavery and Justice at Brown University. His work crosses disciplinary as well as international borders and boundaries of intellectual, cultural history, radical political thought, Caribbean and African politics and literature. And he recently co-curated a national exhibition on Haitian art that will also show in Cape Town, South Africa, and in, Par in Paris. So Tony, do you want to start us off? Great. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. I want to thank the organizers for asking me to uh, speak on this plenary panel, The Power of Art, Freedom Dreams, and the Manufacture of Desire. And I want to begin with a statement made in a speech, a framing statement, made in a speech at that most seminal, one of the most seminal 20th century events in the black radical tradition. That is the 1956 Paris Conference convened by the Journal of Presence Africans and chaired by that remarkable Haitian intellectual, Jean Priest Mars. There is a debate at this conference in 56 in Paris between Leopold Senghor, Franz Fanon, Amy Césaire, William Fontaine, and George Lamin, amongst others, around questions of culture. And this is how the debate is introduced by Jean Priest Mars. And this is Paris, 1956. He says, and I quote him, we must escape from the tyranny of the state, from the slavery of money, and from that cowardness which might lead us to greet certain forms of culture with an uncompromising negative, as though we hold a monopoly on the whole truth. Culture, he continues, is, is, is about is the ways in which he says each individual by their experience and by their aspirations, by their work and their reflections, reconstruct a world which is filled with life, thought and passion and seems to thirst more than ever for justice, love and peace. And that's the ending of the framing discussion. And I thought this might be important to frame to this 56 statement would be important to frame us trying to think around this question of art and freedom. It is a statement, therefore, the statement I've just read, in which culture is not separated from politics. And there is a way in which politics, art, and culture are not contradictory domains. In Western art and Western culture, there is a way in which we consider politics and culture as something separate. I want to suggest to you that this is not so, that they, we need to reframe thinking around questions of art and culture. Let me begin by talking about two persons. One is a Africa, South African artist called Gerard Sikoto, and the second person is a uh, Haitian artist who I've done some work with, and his name is Edward Duval Carrier. If people would think about Gerard Sikoto, if you think about Haitian art, Philomena Oban, the controversial work in this country of African-American Carol Walker. <clears throat> the question of aesthetics is really not about a certain kind of art. The question of aesthetics perhaps is about the actual making of the art itself, and that there's a way in which art and politics, as both acts of making, become very important. This is really very different from the way in which we might want to think about art and the committed artists. We need a committed artist, obviously. We need a certain kind of art in which there's a politicized, if you wish, representative form. But we might want to shift a bit our understanding of aesthetics and art from just a certain kind of representation to begin to think about the actual making of the actual art object itself. Gerard Sokoto, in 1943, draws a series of figures. He's a South African. It is five years before apartheid is instituted. And he knows that apartheid is going to be instituted, so there's many people of African descent, or Africans in South Africa. And he draws a set of pictures, a set of paintings. And these are the titles they give them. Girl in a Yellow Dress, Cape Town Teacher, Cape Town Boy, Girl in a Green Hat, Man in a Green Blanket. And that is particularly important for those of you who know anything about Marikano a couple of years ago. The leader of that strike, who was murdered by the police, wore a green blanket all the time. And there's a remarkable book says, that says, we are, we, a lot of us are here to die today. And he stands upon it with a green blanket. These are not just about representations. 
I would want to suggest to you that these are also archives. And therefore, the question of art and relationship to politics is also that art creates a certain kind of archives which is important for a certain kind of history. Edward de Valcarie. Edward de Valcarie's work is really comes out of a Haitian tradition in which many artists attempt to tell the revolutionary history of Haiti, not as one that is derivative of the French Revolution, but one that has this revolution, it, it, revolution on its own, revolution gestation as ideas on its own, in its own right. And when you look at Edward's work, particularly his latest thing that he has just done, a, a, a ex exhibition that we have just curated, called The Many Faces of Toussaint Louverture, you will see the attempt in which, we att in which there is a way to tell the story in a different way, and to talk about liberty and equality in Haiti and Toussaint's notion of what he called the aristocracy of the skin. There is also, therefore, a question of archive and archive and its relationship to history. So that art, in my view, is, and culture, is really now needs to serve as a certain kind of archive for the black radical tradition and for us to begin to mine uh, with the radical imagination. So let me just turn to that very quickly. I would want to suggest that art and culture are springs for the radical imagination, that we live in a particular moment of neoliberalism, and that in, moment, in that moment of neoliberalism, ideology, in my view, cannot be considered ideology in the way we consider ideology, ideology conventionally, but ideology has moved into what I like to call fantasy and desire. The drive of capital, I would want to suggest, is not just production, but is also to create a certain kind of human being. Capital has always been concerned with creating kinds of human beings, but it has never been its overarching premise. I would want to suggest that in the 21st century, the overarching premise and drive of capital is about not just a certain kind of political economy, but also creating a certain kind of mode of human. In creating that mode of human, the drive of capital is to capture desire and to transform the radical, in, in, in radical Im imagination into something else because for capital and the bourgeoisie, history has ended. It is a drive to saturate self. It is a drive to saturate self into market calculations and it is the radical imagination that actually stops this. It is the radical imagination that gives us the possibility that creates a certain kind of energy for us to begin to think about the new. Therefore, in the end, we are at a moment in history in which the human species requires, in my view, the radical imagination more than ever. Not just to create art, but also to understand that art and politics are about a certain kind of freedom and a way in which we can mark the new. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. We're going to talk a little bit more about that desire and how do we address neoliberalism in a little bit. Um, but first, I'm going to turn to Dream Hampton, who is a writer, an award-winning filmmaker, a social justice organizer. She was the first female editor for Source Magazine, associate producer of Emmy Award-winning Behind the Music, Notorious B.I.G., and she's collaborated also with Jay-Z on his book, Decoded. She also serves on the boards of Young Nation, Detroit Summer, and Write a House, all in Detroit, her hometown. Tom, thank you so much for being with us, Dream. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think that behind me, yeah. What well, is the actual video going to play? Yeah, do you want me to play the video now? Yeah, sure. You don't have to have any music. OK. Um, so I, I wasn't going to talk about anything that was in my bio mm -hmm. <laughs> that Lisa just talked about. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it, in the beginning, I talked to Lisa about what I might talk about when I came here. And given the entire tenor of the conference, I thought about a Renisha McBride kind of rapid response video um, that we made after um, myself and some of the people in this room, like Tawana and Invincible, um, kind of organized um, to make noise in this kind of silence around the way that the police were refusing to prosecute or arrest, even question Ted Wafer um, in Dearborn outside of Detroit after Renisha McBride's arrest, um, but also the way that the media refused um, to name him. Um, and then, and I said, well, and alternately, I, I could talk about 
some of the works that I produce where I'm imagining s new spaces, um, particularly around art, um, that I'd like to create. And Lisa said, well, absolutely go with that. Like, instead of talking about the ways that we're reacting to the kind of absence and silence around black women's bodies in particular, then why don't you share what it is you've done or tried to produce in that vacuum? Dissatisfaction is a group um, out in, from Seattle. Um, they are on a label called Sub Pop, which is, I guess, famous for having put out Nirvana's first albums, if they're famous at all. They're a very underground kind of record label. They're, this is an underground group who's making pretty traditional soul music. Um, at the time that they were um, in this group, when made this debut album, they were a live-in couple. Um, and they asked me to direct their video. I'd been asked to direct videos throughout the years, um, and I'd always turned it down. I was asked to, to direct, really, how is it three minutes already? <laughs> I was <laughs> asked to direct, um, say, Biggie Smalls, One More Chance, and I was like, nah. <laughs> I was like, I'm an auteur, or whatever that meant. It wasn't true, but I had some self-inflated ideas about myself. Um, but w when it came to the satisfaction, I really wanted to um, look at the idea of women being in a space um, with one another where their pleasure was not only centered, but their pleasure was a kind of resistance, um, where they take care of one another. Um, you know, something that not just refutes all of these images of women in the media constantly, whatever like reunion reality shows you have where everyone starts fighting like MMA or whatever. Um, but also this idea that we primp and kind of prime ourselves for an evening out to perform for men. Um, so the video treatment was very simple. It was this idea that it, we would be in a single space and that these women would be um, caring for one another and it looked like what would be an evening out, but they decide that the party is they themselves. Um, so even as I you know, go forward, and then I think that I pulled some images that will probably show after, probably when someone else is speaking, images that I considered disruptive and abnormative, if only because they too kind of center and privilege pleasure um, and I'm, I'm calling it pleasure as resistance, but these are the works of Carrie James Marshall, the work of Latavia Ruby Frazier, the works of Micheline Thomas, um, the work, did I say Carrie James Marshall? Um, there'll be some still images of some of these visual artists who have really disrupted the kind of common narrative of us in a place either of a, path a pathological place or of a place of oppression. Um, so I'm very interested in not just producing work that centers privilege as resistance, but looking at that work. Um, and I'd like to talk more about that. I've, I've read, run out of time somehow, <laughs> really quickly. Um, oh, yes, so there's Carrie James Marshall. And I think they're going to keep going, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, they're going to keep going, maybe a little bit after we can okay. slide through them and you can say who they all are, yeah? Okay. okay yeah. Cool. It's, it's just represents for me a kind of alchemical des density, a, a, like a, a real... Who's this? Oh, that would be Deanna Lawson um, and a terrific model that she met on the A-train um, and got to invite her back to her Brooklyn Brownstone and strip in a chinchilla. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, right. some of these artists are deeply inspiring to me um, as I think of pleasure as resistance. All right, great. I know we'll come back to that, so. <laughs> All right, great. I'm going to turn next to uh, my left here to poet and educator Kevin Koval. He's the co-founder of Louder Than a Bomb, artistic director of Young Chicago Authors, and visiting professor at UIC. Um, his advocacy for the stories of everyday people, his cultural activism and writing, keeps the tradition of Gwendolyn Brooks and Studs Terkel alive here in Chicago. Thanks. Here. Thank you, Doc. All right. Yeah, uh, thank you to uh, Barbara and the organizers for having me. I appreciate it. Excited to be on the panel. And um, I want to eventually get to uh, dream this, the, the idea of a new space. Um, that's something that is essential 
to the work that I think about and do. Um, Spanish transla translation definitely in my ear, so uh, that's going to confuse me. You know, you do your thing, I'm doing my thing. You know what I mean? It's good. It's good. No, no, it's good. No, no, it's excellent. I like it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I th I'm thinking of these few things. I'm thinking about the artist as daredevil. Um, and I take a lot of pictures around the city of graffiti and street art, and um, I'm writing a play with my uh, colleague Idris Goodwin about uh, a crew of graffiti writers in, in Chicago, MUL, the Made You Look crew, who bombed the Modern Wing in February of 2010. I don't mean bombed like blew up, I mean bombed like painted the outside of it illegally. Um, and I think a lot about the artist as daredevil, about the willing to risk one's life or uh, ability to make a living for your art and what does that mean and, and what are we willing to do to create a kind of art that is uh, risky. Um, and then for me, I also think just in the work that I do, I think about the artist as organizer. Uh, KRS1 said, uh, um, you know, that's why we build it in a cipher. You'll hear me, kid, the government is building in a pyramid. And so that idea about new cultural space. Uh, Chicago recently lost a street artist named Brooks Golden. Uh, who wrote also under the pseudonym Sevenist, and he would uh, have in the streets pictures of owls and um, these like, you know, uh, messianic symbols and triangles and was super interesting. And he did a poster a number of years ago called, uh, that the title was The Culture is the Art. And so I think so much about what kind of culture we're, we're creatively collecting. Uh, cr you know, building together, I should say. And uh, a lot of the Nabam, the Chicago Youth Poetry Festival, was started because, in part, I was looking for a space and a crew to connect with and build with. Um, you know, growing up a uh, white Jewish hip hop kid in the suburbs meant that I, know, I knew no one who rapped, and I wanted to find a community who could get down with me. So I had to go search out that community. I'm going to share this poem with you about that time. It's called Moment Beat Tapes. If you know Chicago hip hop, a generation was reared on the Moment's beat tapes. Moment beat tapes were copped from gramophone. Cassettes jammed into a factory issued stereo deck of the hoopty I rolled around in. A bucket, bass, and drum looped with some string sample fixed. A sliver of perfect. The scraps of something adjusted, reconstituted. There was so much space to fill. An invitation to utter, Ikra, Allah said to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, A to B side and around again, a circle, a cipher. I'd drive down and back, Clark in my mom's Dodge for the latest volumes of sound. I'd stutter and stop and begin again, lonesome and on fire. None, no one I knew rapped. I'd recite alone, free, styling, shaping my voice, a sapling, hatchling, rapping my life, emerging in the dark of an empty car. There was a time when hip hop felt like a secret. Society of wizards and wordsmiths, magicians meant to find you or that you were meant to find. Like rappers I listened and memorized in history class, talked specifically to me, for me. And sometimes you'd see a kid whisper to himself in the corner of a bus seat and you asked if he rhymed and traded a poem, a verse, like a fur pelt, trapping some gold or food, this sustenance. You didn't have to ride solo after that anymore. Jonathan was the first kid I met who rapped. He was black from a prep school, wore ski, go ski goggles on top his head, and listened to Wu-Tang, which meant he was always rhyming about science and chess. His pops made him read Sun Tzu. His mans was Omega, a fat Puerto Rican kid who wrote graffiti and smoked beaties, and they'd have friends, and the back seat would swell, and the word got passed and scooped like a ball on the playground. you juggle however long your mind could double dutch. Sometimes you take what you were given, lift off like a trampoline, a rocket launch, and Sometimes you trip, scrape your knees, tongue tied, not quick, words stuck on loop, like, like words stuck like that, but breakthrough, mind night, sharp, mind darts, polished and gleaming. We'd ride for the sake of rhyming, take the long way home or wherever the fuck we were going, cruise down Lake Shore and back, blasting, blazing, polishing these gems, just trying to get our mind, right? Thank you, poet. I also want to thank the Spanish language translation on that one. That was like quite amazing. <laughs> that was crazy. All right, great. Um, 
<laughs> Thanks. All right, we're now going to turn to the uh, electric and creative presence of Koya Potts. She's a playwright, poet, director, feminist activist, um, and she stays making collaborative and challenging, provocative, and wickedly funny theater. She was the co-founder of Teatro Luna in 2000, is a professor at DePaul University, and the director of Free Street Theater. Great. Hi. It's so nice to be here. I love looking at everybody. I think it would be terrible if I took a picture, but I want to so bad from this vantage point. So, like Lisa said, I'm a writer, director, professor, and the relatively new artistic director of Free Street Theater, which is founded in 1969 and is in its 45th season of making work that challenges where theater belongs and who belongs in a theater. We make original ensemble performance from scratch and have been committed to broad inclusivity and accessibility for decades. We're not missionary theaters. We're not a kind of company that takes theater to a community. We make theater with a community by the invitation of the community, and I think that's really important. Um, we were the first racially integrated theater company in Chicago, and the first to think systematically about the barriers that separate us from living authentic or free lives. The name Free Street refers not just to our commitment to make free theater in the streets, um, but also to the idea that there is something about creating theater as a community in a community that uniquely asks us to reckon with our human selves, to acknowledge and honor ourselves as individuals, to wrestle with being more honest, more open, and most important, to remember that we exist within and are accountable to a larger community. All right, it's no secret to any of us that we're living in a deeply segregated city that faces real structural problems and seems to repeatedly enact brutal and dehumanizing policies. I don't think I need to cite statistics about education, incarceration, concentration of wealth and resources. This is what we're talking about at this conference, but I'm bringing it up to point to why I exist in an almost constant state of fury about the state of Chicago theater. I'm so mad all the time. Don't get me mad. Don't get me wrong. I love theater. I believe in theater. I've invested my entire life in making theater at the expense of other forms of organizing because I believe it can do something other kinds of theater can't. Um, so I don't want to talk a lot about how theater replicates Chicago's segregation, the way that we have almost 300 theater companies in the city. Almost all of them are white, and almost all of them are concentrated on the northeast side. Um, and the way that even diverse companies are in the business of representing um, diverse stories and representing the other rather than including the other in that storytelling process. And if we don't think this matters, we should remember that Chicago has the third largest arts economy in the country, but 74% of all the people making money from the arts in the city are white and college educated. Not only are our stories not getting told, but somebody else is getting paid to not tell them. I told you I'm so crabby, uh, but I'll move on to the part of it where I'll tell you what I think theater can do, because I promise to try to be positive. Here's what I believe. One, theater is a live act and a communal offering. It requires us to be in a space together. That alone can be a radical act, especially in Chicago. Two, theater is an empathetic art. It asks us not just to think, but to feel, to get in touch with our feelings and the feelings of others, and to remember the human story in every issue. Three, theater allows for multiple perspectives, for putting lots of different conversations together in ways that overlap and juxtapose. No one has to be right. We can start just by being together and by listening. Four, theater is a time-based art. When the show must go on, the show must go on. It's time, the audience is waiting. So working together to make a show requires us to also learn how to work together as a community towards a goal. Remember, we don't have to yet agree, we just have to learn to work together. Five, theater allows us to tell stories about the world as it is. Our stories are real ones, complicated, but it also allows us to imagine the world as we want it to be, to create even for a short time a version of the world we are working towards. Theater can represent, it can critique, but it can also help us to practice and help us to enact. Six, theater is something we all already have the resources to do. We can't all pick up a camera or um, pick up a pen. I mean, pens are easy to acquire, but there isn't one person in this room who doesn't know how to tell a story or at least recognize when a story isn't working. If you've ever gossiped, told a joke, or lied, um, you're already started rehearsing. You have the good it's something we can do together. 
Seven, theater is fun. Half of it is playing games. I mean, organizing is serious work, but sometimes it's nice to just act stupid. And I don't mean like going out and getting wasted, but you know, I'm 40, but I can still play tag kind of way. Um, eight, theater can happen anywhere, on streets, in schools, at meetings, in boardrooms, even in theaters. That's a paraphrase of the great Augusto Boal. Um, that means theater offers us the opportunity to take a message to a lot of different audiences in a lot of different spaces, and the space spectacle of storytelling um, or storytelling might get someone's attention in a way that a bullhorn might not. Nine, theater requires an audience, so it can be a great way of building community around a social change issue. People come for the show, maybe they stay for the organizing strategy. I hope we have an organizing strategy. And ten, finally, the struggle is real. It is exhausting and it is different for all of us. The act of being live together, of listening to each other's stories, of trying to feel someone else's point of view can remind us that we are not alone. You are here, I am here, we are here together, so the question is, what are we going to do? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I definitely want to circle back and think about how social uh, movement building and social change might be understood as long-term durational theater making collaboratively across the globe. You know. Um, all right, we're going to turn now to Mark Anthony Neal. He's a professor of black popular culture at Duke University. He's one of our most prolific thinkers about the history of popular music, black popular culture, black masculinity, sexism, and homophobia in black communities. He works extensively in new media through his blog, New Black Man, and his weekly webcast, Left of Black. Um, he was last year in residence at the Hip Hop Archives at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard University. Thanks, Mark. Thanking the organizers and, of course, Barbara for the invitation. Black channels, black Twitter, and other moments of black interiority. Can you hurry up and think? And such would be the demand for the intellectual committed to deep thinking and intricate moves of the post-structuralist kind in a world where things like mortgages, car notes, 401ks, prep school applications, and the next episode of Real Housewives of Atlanta seem motivation to do everything but deep thinking. It is perhaps easy to think that the expansiveness of contemporary culture and our access to an archive of digital data that was unimaginable even a decade ago should translate into a requisite expansiveness of easily available deep thought. I'm not always quite sure when so much cultural criticism mas masquerades as little more than lowbrow film and music reviews with the sarcized words that say very little about aesthetics, politics, or modes of production. I stand accused. I am as guilty as any in this endeavor. I am reminded, as always, of Fred Moten's description of Harriet Jacobs, writing at irregular intervals against the specter of a, quote, anti-abolitionist discipline and surveillance. Escape to freedom, more like an escape to my own damn mind, Jacobs might have been desiring to say. Recalling the late Sekou Sundiata's notion that we were dreamed by some slaves just trying to find the freedom to climb up into their own imagination, freedom dreams, if you will, the little things that we take for granted, recalling yet another Another, this time, bluesman Albert King, in his own recollection of something Ivory Joe Hunter once said, when I lost my baby, I almost lost my mind. But because to lose your mind is to something like losing death. And even your roundaway rapper understands this, under, un ordering thoughts on scribblings, no doubt on an Android device, brought and paid for by illicit moments on subways, at bus stops, in tenement vestibules, and during break times at McDonald's. I think Harriet Jacobs has a bit more to teach it the 21st century Negro Gentia. On the run, as Fred Moten might say, in response to any query about what animates black art. Or as Moten did say, quote, black art stages it, performs it by way of things breaking and entering, exiting the exclusionary frame of a putatively ennobling, quickening representations to which they are is submitted. Like those Negroes of spiritual old who, in making a way out of no way, had to think themselves free, but freedom and escape from what? For Jacob's freedom was a crawl space underneath a house, and some might ask, what kind of freedom is that? It is, as Moten might say, or rather did say, the lawless freedom of the imagination. Perhaps we've been a little too literal about what this thing called freedom is. If being on the run doesn't allow us to be one with our own minds, the ultimate feedback loop in conversation with our own mind beyond the demands to hurry up and think like one might have to if one is always on the run. 
So escape to the resistance to fugitivity might fuel a few lasting and even timeless expressions in the church of blackness, but never without the chance to engage our own minds, where we can still, even in captivity, imagine a freedom intellectually, mentally, philosophically, and spiritually that we can scribble on the walls of crawl spaces, be they Facebook, Tumblr, or even black Twitter, and more than a few words on that in a bit. I'd like to suggest that this very personal yet communicable feedback loop, a rapid, all-encompassing exchange of information, genetic, philosophical, and akin to what filmmaker Arthur Jaffa has called and located in early Isley's opening solo from the Isley Brothers' Voyage to Atlantic. The feedback loop that I'd like to suggest writ large as blackness partially explains why blackness never seems to fully emancipate itself from the very dynamic that blackness aspires to transcend. Digital distortions, we might say, in some other realm, those mystical realms we often simply refer to, often in hushed tones these days, as black Twitter. A magical and digital black interiority that binds a public with a private, that is indecipherable without access to this black interiority, or what I might call black channels. But first, a few words about black Twitter. Recalling Manju's 2000 10 slate piece, which addressed how black people use Twitter. Yet another example of mainstream culture's fascination, even obsession, with the ways that black people have always utilized technology. The conversation remains the same. Instead of Booker, what are the drums saying? As political scientist Adolph Reed once famously described the work of black public intellectuals, the question today is, what are those niggers tweeting? Perhaps this is as it should be. Black folk are in the unique position of having been cutting edge technology, the kind of technology that helped drive the United States into advanced capitalism and global domination. Such intimacies have historically manifested themselves in innovative and quirky uses of technology. Two turntables in the mixer, sky pagers accessed by late 20th century drug dealers with designs on 21st century global economies, and of course, folks in apartment, the folks in apartment 2B who had cable since 1982, or rather at least a decade before Time Warner or cable vision showed up in the hood. <laughs> Yet there are other moment, concrete moments to consider. Twitter is nothing more than advanced technology used to animate existing and new social networks. These networks have always existed. The field songs utilized by enslaved Africans on southern plantations were a form of social media. Hell, there was a time not so long ago that the stoop was our Twitter. One of the best examples of such social media was the Greensboro sit-ins February 1, 1960. Thank you. All right, so we've, we've, I know, we figured out that the panelists have uh, figured out how to game the five minutes by speaking like <laughs> double fast, but this is actually really making it hard for the Spanish language translators, so I'm, we'll push the time a little bit to maybe six minutes, you know, and so that we can slow down a little. We're sorry about that. I, Thank I, I you. Ju I just had 16 <laughs> bars, Lisa, just 16 yeah, I bars. I know, that was 16 <laughs> bars, like, double fast. <laughs> All right, great. We're going to turn to Ronak Kapadia now. He's a cultural theorist of race, transnational, queer, and feminist cultural studies, visual culture and aesthetics, critical prison and security studies, and he's at work at his first book, yeah? Yeah. The Sensorial Life of Empire, Race, Security, and the Queer Calculus of Counterinsurgency. He's an assistant professor here at UIC and has served on the executive board of directors of both the Association for Asian American Studies and FIERCE, a member-led community organization working to build the leadership and power of LGBTQ youth of color and NYC. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks to the organizers for all their effort, labor, vision, and especially Barbara Ransby, who brings so much power and light to this campus. And I, I know that I benefit from it. Um, so I want to talk about what it means to dream of freedom in the context of the US's permanent war and its security and surveillance empire. Um, specifically, I want to talk about art in the age of drone warfare, and I'm going to have some images of anti-drone activists and artists who've been making, uh, making art around this question, specifically visual art. So um, in my work, I look, I'm trying to write about the expansion of the U.S. global security state, and I tell this story through the lens of contemporary visual and performance art. And my main argument is that if we want to understand modern security politics, especially the modes of surveillance, imprisonment, and targeted assassinations perfected in both the domestic and international context of the war on terror, then we need an alternate approach to the maps of strategic thinkers and security analysts who've been telling us how we should look, think, and feel about the world. 
By turning to artists, I want to uncover more critical, more imaginative, more utopian responses to US imperial violence, as well as the alternative models of affiliation and collectivity that these violent politics have engendered. So I'm going to hone in specifically on drones, and I've already cut down what I'm going to say. Just two ideas, two points. Um, everybody know what drones are, more or less? So drone technologies have become the growing trend, the preferred preferred tool for US military and security planners in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan. The CIA and the US military are carrying out an illegal targeted killing program in which people far from any battlefield are, are being determined to be enemies of the state and killed without charge or trial. The executive branch has claimed the unchecked authority to put the names of citizens and others on kill lists on the basis of secret determinations based on secret evidence that individuals meet a secret definition of the enemy. So lots of secrets. I think that artists have been documenting the impacts for drones for a long time, and their aesthetic projects are useful for thinking about redacted archives, state secrecy, the repressed and disqualified forms of evidence of US imperialism that continues to violently unfold. So two ideas for thinking about drones and freedom dreams together. The first is the idea of drone creep, which refers to the use of drones in everyday settings by the police and other civilian agencies, including corporations like Amazon. So right now, drones operate operate lethal, lethally in the borderlands of the world, right? Lots of, like, lots of imperial technologies. These weapons are being perfected in colonial laboratories like places in Pakistan and Palestine, but they're coming soon to a city or site near you, and we see this on a number of fronts. For instance, the US law enforcement is greatly expanding its use of domestic drones for surveillance. Drone manufacturers are considering offering police the option to arm rem remote controlled aircraft here at home. The US Customs and Border Patrol are using predator drones along the borders with Mexico and Canada. And there are already is a drone arms race with the US, no surprise, and Israel as the main exports of this technology. By 2020, there could be 30,000 drones in US skies, and that's a US estimate. So I think drones are an, a perfect illustration of both the domestic and international context of war making, US war making. This is especially important for activists and scholars in this room who are interested in connecting the unprecedented US domestic policing and prison expansion project here that disproportionately targets working class people of color to the newly emergent global prison archipelago that is part and parcel to the US global war on terror. Slow down. So many contradictions. Time, slow down. Um, so part of what we're seeing is that there's a blurring between the military and the police. And if anybody who's studied the black freedom movement in this country knows that during the Cold War, counterinsurgency was not only perfected in Latin America, the Middle East, but on black, indigenous, and racialized immigrant populations here in the US as well. And I think that drones are a classic and really uh, perfect illustration of that um, idea of imperialism coming home to roost. So that's the first idea. The second is that we need to challenge the ethical common sense in Washington that tells us that drones are solving our national security problems. The US argues that it's surgical, that it's precise, that it's rational, that it's bureaucratic, even scientific, and that it's a form of warfare that replaces individual thought with machinic certainty. But of course, we know that this is false, right? We don't need all the human rights reports to tell us, but they are telling us that this is false. Um, I can tell you all about the consequences and devastation on local communities all over the world. But um, let me just wrap up by saying that I think the reason the art is so important and turning to art is so crucial is because it offers us a form of poetic knowledge, as Robin Kelly talks about, a form of critique, a moment of refreshment, an opportunity to th rethink anti-racist, anti-imperialist, queer and feminist politics anew. And our goal here should be to challenge the ethical common sense of US state violence. Um, and I think that the art activism in the age of drones is significant not simply because it's offering us a diagnosis, a critique of the maps of exclusion and political violence that characterize the here and now, but also for, alter for the alternative models of subjectivity, collectivity, and power, for the alternative models of power that these works imagine and inhabit. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. I beat her. I beat the time clock. <laughs> Do it again. Um, great. Uh, last but not least, we have Ivan Arenas. He's a scholar, architect, and artist, and a member of the Social Justice Initiative staff. He has curated exhibits at the Pop-Up Just Art Space and has spent time organizing with and documenting the art of protest in Oaxaca. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, hola, everyone. Um, so happy to have he people here in the room amidst all this radical art and have all these artists 
and all of you here to have this important conversation. I want to start by knowing firsthand all the hard work that comes into making this conference and to putting this together by thanking everyone at SJI for the work that they've done and all the partners and people who brought it all together. We couldn't have done it without you. But I also want to thank SJI for um, making social justice more than just empty rhetoric at this university, and I think that's also really important. All right. Um, it seems to me that the components of a critical assessment of the moment involves an analysis of the injustice and violence of a capitalist carceral state and society which produces profit by making surplus subjects and squeezing the life out of them. That is the active demobilization of people through jobs that offer no benefits or a living wage and a global economic order that makes and preys on the precarious lives of impoverished majorities. Equally important, in an radical assessment are the ways in which media and our education system work to effectively curtail and corral our creativity in any sense of alternative futures. How is it that the media messages covering everything from the public spaces of our cities to the clothes covering our bodies offer weapons of mass distraction that channel our desires towards the consumption of goods and that in fact define the consumption of goods as the good life? An economic order whose slogan might be best described as no politics, just purchase, please. <laughs> How standardized testing in education offers a paradigm suggesting that there is only one and only one right answer. How schools are intended not so much to expand our imaginations, but rather to teach us how to be disciplined subjects that can sit in an orderly manner in rows and follow the directions of an authority figure. A model that made good factory workers and may be good for daydreaming, but not so much for unleashing our radical imagination. How we have traded our sense that anything is possible for the shackles of a monthly paycheck that barely covers rent, food, and the student and credit card loans and mortgage payments that make it necessary for us to settle for jobs that offer an income but do not satisfy our aspirations. Now, given these challenges, people have mobilized and come together to form social movements, and the state has often responded with violence. This was the case in Oaxaca, Mexico, where I worked with a group of political street artists that grew out of a social movement stemming from the violent repression of a teacher's strike by the state's governor. And my comments largely stem from this work. At a most basic level, by placing stencils on the streets, Oaxaca street artists are reclaiming people's right to define alternative visions of the good life. The global discourse of democratic public space and capitalist consumer utopias masks the production of cities of walls with ever-shrinking public spaces and publics. Stencils placed on city walls resist the privatization of public space and attempt to constitute the streets of the city as spaces of debate. Yet the art of protest does more than simply expose the contemporary contradictions of a so-called democratic and capitalist economic order secured through violence. Stencils placed on the street constituted important political acts, not only because these were acts of defiance, but precisely because they were acts of creation. These are acts of creation that open up space for people to express their freedom dreams and to decolonize their minds. When Oaxaca was occupied by the social movement, the walls of this UNESCO World Heritage Site became the largest community mural in America. A broad cross-section of society participated in the creation of this collective mural, and this made the city's walls an important site for the public projection of discontents and wishes for alternative futures. The art of protest can be an important reminder, then, that we all have the right and creative capacity to manifest our opinion and to participate in the shared dialogue about our future. The art of protest breaks up the cultural imagination that only lone geniuses such as Picasso and Pollock are artists and remind us that all of us are creative and have a point of view and experiences to express. And yet its most radical and creative power in my mind is not so much in expressing any particular individual's discontent, but in the ways in which the art of protest makes a collective and in doing so unleashes a radical imagination. In my experience, the art of protest is not limited to the visuals of stencils and placards and banners, but also encompasses marches, sit-in strikes, assemblies, and other creative acts and collective acts where people come together to protest a grievance. The act of coming together at an Occupy or Oaxacan encampment, for example, was spurred on by a shared scream of no, basta. Yet by sharing experiences and negotiating internal differences in an assembly, or by the sweaty work of laboring together, because you cannot build a barricade alone or feed a thousand people by yourself, the sweaty work of laboring together in a moment of danger, through this work, people found not just a scream of no, but many shared yeses. The radical power of Oaxaca street art was in part in opening up space for the marginalized people to express their history and experiences. And for the first time in a long time, people saw their experiences reflected on the walls covering over its typical consumerist message. This helped create a collective. But it was in the way in which the art of protest brought people and artists to labor together 
that they could express and find their freedom. To put it differently, the political function of stencils or marches or assemblies in Oaxaca and everywhere is not limited to their sociopolitical message. The fertile power of the art of protest involves much more than the trick of pulling back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz to expose the dark workings of power. Though crucial, its radical power goes even further than putting forward alternative visions of society on the city's walls. The most radical and creative aspect lay in the way that the collective practices of the art of protest made new social and political relations possible. So let me anchor this in a Oaxacan example briefly. Its social movement mobilized over a million people in a state of three and a half million people with the one demand that it remove its governor, and yet it failed to do that. So how did the art of protest give birth to and realize freedom dreams? What you saw in the streets of Oaxaca, aside from advertising prior to the social movement, was graffiti. Since most people could not read this, graffiti was looked at with disdain as unreadable scribbles made by disaffected and vagrant gangs of young people. The social movement pushed these chavos banda, as they were called, to develop their political participation. Incited to write their stories and points of view on the walls through stencils, the chavos banda reworked their image as pot smokers and thieves. From an image of vagrants and vagabonds involved in petty turf wars, through their art and voice, youths pushed others to actively listen and won people's respect. This goes a long way in explaining how mothers who would ordinarily have called the police upon seeing street kids with spray cans outside their doors came out during the social movement not only to encourage them, but even to join them. So by assembling people together, the art of protest develops or rediscovers the creative capacities of people that are today suppressed by capitalist consumerism, a stifling media and education system, and an imagination of success that's limited to the individual rather than the collective. Social movements are, after all, about moving people about collectively mobilizing their bodies, minds, and imaginations. In Oaxaca, mobilized people found that creativity was itself a generative political practice that forged not only collective dreams of freedom, which also had transformative effects, transformative effects for those that were laboring together. And that is both, of, both its limit and its possibility. Thanks. All right, um, I just want to start off by maybe where, I want to begin where Yvonne left us around the collective and the notion of community aesthetics. Um, because I'm wondering sort of in the realm of art, which is so invested in the charismatic individual and the sort of notion of a genius, whether we're talking about Maya Angelou or Jay-Z or Beyonce, right? Um, how do we think about the role of the individual in protest art and the aesthetics of resistance. Also go to the question of our individual tweeting and all of that as a mode of resistance to Mark, throw that out to the panel. You know, who gets to determine what is art, who's art, and who's making it, and what's the aesthetic of it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think real quick that um, it, it's a, the myth. It's a myth of the individual as opposed to the community. And I think that that's just capitalism. But the truth is, is that artists create in the context of a community. And really, you can tell art history by telling the story of communities in discourse with one another. Um, you know, we're looking uh, at... You know, like just yesterday on the New York Times, um, the uh, Dark Room Collective, a group of poets, uh, had front page of the New York Times, right? And that is not about Thomas Sarah Ellis, it's about the Dark Room community and th their voices in conversation with the literary canon, but also the context in which they were raised. I mean, they. You know, this is like the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, one of the things that we're interested in doing is having the comparison between the Dark Room uh, Collective and the Native Tongue Posse. So, you know, how did the poetics of Q-Tip and Jungle Brothers and Moni Love and MC Light uh, play into what Kevin Young and Sharon Strange were also doing on the page? Um, and you could tell, and you should tell, I think, that story throughout time. Um, I think the graffiti artists especially will uh, be... Um, you know, overt in repping their crew and the I, and that the, the, the hip hop cipher is about the I in the context of the we. If you notice a piece of graffiti, you'll see on the side that graffiti writers will also put other writers' names in the margins of that piece, or always kind of rep their crew name as well. And I think that you are always participating in a community dialogue, and I think that's powerful. You know, Rhyme, Rhyme Fest suggested this earlier. I mean, he was talking about politics, but, you know, there's no individual figures in politics, right? And he's an artist, so he understands this idea of community. 
when you talk about black culture, for instance, I mean, black culture is a sampling culture. It always has been. Um, it's just an issue now for us in the 21st century now that their intellectual property law that tries to block our creativity. But black artists have always borrowed with each other. They understood there was a community of folks who produce particular aesthetics. When Tony said at the, at the beginning of this panel to think about you know, black art is an archive for the radical imagination, for radical movement. You know, it's an archive that's built by communities of people that are, and it's always there for us to go back and tap into. Always there for, you know, what's changed the game is now the way that that archive has been monetized in specific kind of ways that makes it troubling. I'm looking at the laptop here with Rap Genius. And, and you know, Rap Genius, which was given an $18 million infusion two years ago by a couple of venture capitalists who want to use rap genius, rap music, as a model for annotating everything that they can annotate in the world. Um, and so that's, those are the kind of questions, and, and you know, community has to push back against that, right? I, I want to throw out another question, and not to call out uh, Koya, <laughs> but um, on your blog, for example, you identify yourself as a lipstick a lip gloss connoisseur. <laughs> and I wanted to talk a little bit about, <laughs> well, I love that, but I, I guess I want to talk a little bit um, about pleasure, desire, sort of the contradictory um, sort of things that inspire us and are catalysts for you know, revolutionary movements. Because sometimes art really is instrumentalized in a way which it so easily becomes sort of another ism of what the revolution is. And you sort of, always are challenging us to think differently. And I think the images that Dream also put up there really give voice to also a sort of set of contradictory pleasures and desires, which sometimes don't jive with the revolutionary line. And I sort of want to try to tackle that a little bit and sort of what that means in art and the spaces that art creates for those kinds of desires. And you too. Yeah, so I am always happy when lipstick comes, I mean lip gloss, oh my god, I'm a betrayer, <laughs> comes up in the conversation. You know, I think that pleasure is really, really important. One of the things that happens a lot, Free Street does most of its work with youth, not exclusively, we do a lot of work with organizations and um, community spaces, but you know, um, one of the things I find a lot with youth artists is that they feel like to make serious theater about serious political issues it can't be funny. And I think, well, theater has to be pleasurable. We have to come together in a space and enjoy it. I think that is a, a factor sometimes that gets left out of organizing is how can we find joy in each other and how can we remember that we're trying to build a world we want to live in. And so I think um, centering pleasure, I do it through humor. That's not the only way to do it. Um, I think in theater that's an easy way. Um, but I also think we can't be too hard on ourselves um, about the places where we find pleasure. We have to ask critical questions all the time. And God knows, I worked on a play called On Natural Spaces about urban toxicity, and it ruined my life because now I can't put anything on my lips that is not organic um, because you swallow your lip gloss a thousand times a day. Um, but I have a poem, I'm a poet also, where I talk about lip gloss and why it's important to me. For about five years, I was the only Spanish-speaking counselor on the Chicago Rape Crisis Hotline, which means that I had a pager, it was a pager then, um, with me all of the time. Um, anytime somebody needed uh, to have crisis counseling in Spanish, I was the person they would call, I would go to the hospital. And at the time, I was what I call a capital F feminist, you know, <laughs> I don't know where me of, of, you know, I hate the patriarchy, I still hate the patriarchy. I didn't shave my armpits. The, that was part of hating the patriarchy then. Um, and one day I got a phone call that was so bad, I won't reiterate it because I'm, I'm not trying to re-traumatize anybody. But I remember afterwards going to Walgreens and just grabbing like fistfuls of lip gloss and glossy magazines. And I wanted to just for a second live in a world where things were beautiful and it didn't matter and where I didn't have to be scared of being pretty, like somehow I was sending the wrong message. I was policing myself in a different way. You know, I'm from a Latina community where like my mom is a hardcore leftist, but God forbid I leave the house without earrings or lip gloss, you know, or <laughs> lipstick. Um, but I was resisting all of that because I felt like that's what 
made me a good activist. And I think we really have to find the balance between not buying into having these kind of capitalized corporate identities, but we remember that we have to find our spaces of love for ourselves and pleasure in our everyday lives. One of the people who I turn to again and again, and I'm thinking about this idea of community versus the individual. I mean, obviously, a lot of the people that I looked at um, as I began even thinking about being an artist or someone who thought about art um, belong to the black arts movement. And I, th I think about the difference between an Ed Bullins and an Adrian Kennedy or even a Leroy Jones. I mean, you know, and, and even Clement Greenberg's, you know, um, contention that, you know, art for art's sake versus what obviously Ed Bullins and people like Emery Douglas were trying to do. But for me, one of my real heroes is Octavia Butler. And, um, <laughs> yes, of course, we love Octavia. Um, we know how she can be instructive. Well, people like Adrienne Marie Brown are, are creating whole kind of workshops around the way that Octavia Butler's work and her imagining of these near-future dystopias, these post-apocalyptic spaces that are quite grim, how um, there are still embedded in her, in her thinking and in her fiction ideas about how we can move forward as communities. Now, she imagines these small cadres um, which I guess wouldn't be so different than, you know, the myth of Castro coming out of the mountain with 12 people or, I mean, you know, this idea or what um, Ill talks about, quoting Grace Lee Boggs, it's not about a critical mass, it's about critical connections. But at the same time, when I think about Octavia Butler, the individual, I think of her as very much alone very much in a private space, very much asocial. People talk about her um, as asexual even. Um, someone who never learned to drive, though she lived in Los Angeles all these years. Um, someone who didn't have many friends, who was socially awkward, who worked hard to overcome a stuttering problem to go on one of the very few book tours she did for Fledgling, where she kind of very reticently connected with um, the audiences, her devotees, who had all these ideas that they wanted to, to impose on her. So there's always this intention. And here's a, you know, a woman who was imagining these small cadres moving around these near future dystopias, re, like creating whole new worlds, led by women always. But she herself being very much not a part of a community at all, very much retreating into the, the incredibly intimate space of her own mind. Um, Filmmaking, you know, which I try to do sometimes, is an incredibly collaborative and also capitalistic venture that takes lots of people. Writing, I mean, I may take my influences and some of them are ghosts into a room with me when I write, but it, it's a very solitary, you know, it's a very solitary proposition to sit down and write. And reading is a very solitary, you know, proposition. We do that usually in a very, you know, all by ourselves. Um, I, I imagine painting would be something kind of similar, although we may look at visual arts collectively. Um, painters absolutely produce that work in isolation. Now that doesn't mean that you don't take, again, like I was saying with writing, all of your influences into the space with you. But I, I'm absolutely fascinated by what you said, Mark, about liberating the, the mind, you know, this space where so many artists retreat to and live in and flourish. Um, and I hate to say it in a space like this where it's all about community building, but often it is a solitary proposition, you know? Um, we're running short on time, so I definitely want to open up the floor for your questions. Um, there's, I, there's a couple of arms up. Are people gonna, do people have mics? Okay, Dina's coming to pass out the mic. Thank you, Dina, for everything you do, in addition to the mic. <laughs> um, great. All right, and if you could keep your questions short and succinct, and I'm not gonna fetishize the question. If you have like a short comment and you wanna say it, you can do that too. <laughs> um, yeah, sure, how about right here? And then right over there too. Is there another mic? Go ahead. Say your Hello, name. Hi everyone, I'm Hello. Leo. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, I'm an artist myself, a multimedia artist. I do a lot of different things. 
And one thing I always struggle with is getting my point across to other people. So when uh, looking at politics through an artistic uh, view, uh, how do you get your uh, political agenda or personal beliefs off to other people? All right, we're going to take three in a row and then to put it into the thing. So, yep. Lynette, he already actually spoke before, but oh, here. he already had a question before, so I was going to Lisa. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so the first plenary today was a lot about kind of the past of social justice issues and things, and, and there was a lot of talk about needing to dig deeper back into that, and, and this feels like a very different space in that, and I'm wondering how maybe what is happening now creatively through the art and kind of new history making and uh, different forms, how that can be retained in history as something that's documented and remembered, because it feels like it's not, I don't know, I guess I'll always do that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. And then Hello, right um, my name is Suad. I had a question about um, pleasure, this idea of pleasure. So I was wondering, one, how people defining pleasure, when they talk about pleasure as persistence, and what exactly does it look like? Because one of the things that I'm interested in or find frustrating sometimes is that, particularly in sort of black intellectual circles, is that pleasure as freedom of liberation is only when it's sort of explicitly sexual, right? So only when it's someone like naked in a chinchilla, right? But are there ways to, are there, are there other, this can it look like other ways so that they're actually in the discourse around this and not another kind of normativity is being posed upon people? Yeah, thanks. All right, great. Those are three great questions. Um, panelists, do you want to take it up? Let's go. Just wasting time. <laughs> Don't be shy. Um, I think that it was Robin Spencer that tweeted earlier something about liberating ourselves from normative ideas of desire, like creating like radical. I, I think that what uh, Deanna Lawson what would I, I would find abnormative and disruptive about that image of a naked woman in Chichilla would have to do um, with her age, at, you know, at 74 years old, um, kind of owning that space, um, and that not being that being absolutely abnormative. But I, I do understand what you're saying: pleasure being completely tied um, to sex. Um, I don't. I, I mean, obviously, this becomes not just about liberating ourselves from very corporate, when it comes down to it, and, and capitalist ideas of desire, I mean, and patriarchal and white supremacists, um, but it also comes down to, the idea for me is about resistance, like the, the different ways that we can resist, I mean, we've been also given a script in our movement work and in, in the kind of work that we even do as artists who want to disrupt normative narratives, we've been given a script, and that's what I meant about the Ed Bullens, Emory Douglas, even Amiri, Leroy Jones, um, maybe more so as Amiri Baraka. I mean, obviously, that could be a whole panel <laughs> about the two of them, um, but I don't know. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to police, you know, Adrian Kennedy and Susan Lori Parks, um, their their particular approaches to to their art, you know. Um, but when I think of pleasure as resistance, um, I also think about growing up in the '70s in Detroit, um, where so much community building was done in basements with like little pink champagne fountains and Parliament playing and and blue lights and red lights and black lights and um, you know all of these spaces that were explicitly about pleasure you know with community at the center you know this isn't the solitary notion or even the one-on-one -on -one or, or however many partners one it takes for people to have a pleasurable experience but um, you know it, it was also about this kind of this community um, aspect of it too Thanks, Dream. And someone else want to jump in? Either on that or another one of the questions, yeah. too. Tony? Tony, can you pass the mic to Tony? Uh, thanks. Um, if I could say two things very quickly. One, I think that the, the business of art is 
really very important to, as I said, the creation of archives, but also it's important about constructing alternative histories um, and the ways in which the artists I know who do this very well, um, Haitian artists do it, is that you cannot begin to get a particular view of Haitian history without not understanding, quite frankly, what some of these artists have been doing. You can't, the, the best understanding of the American occupation of Haiti between 1915 and 1934 are a set of paintings done by a man called Philemé Oban, the best. Um, from, the, uh, from the activity of the murdering of the rebel leader to, um, to how America played out, played out its occupation. Absolutely, absolutely remarkable, tremendous artist. But one of the things that happens is because he is not seen as, quote unquote, as a voodoo practitioner, he's not, in fact, he's a Baptist man, um, the, he's not taken up in, this, in the Western art world because he, the way in which the Western art world begins to think about questions of Haiti is about voodoo and zombies and so on. And, and, that's, and the voodoo artists are abs voodoo is central to the art forms in Haiti, but it is not the only thing. And that there is an alternative history of that place that is in those archives that we need to begin to look at rather than just in the sacred arts, uh, which is the wood art, which I, consider, which I consider sacred arts. So I think there's a question of a new historiography, um, and I think it's done in Haiti, it's done in South Africa, there's a whole set of new artists in Benin who are trying all sorts of things that have to do with constructing this new historiography. You can tell the history of the, of the Congo with a remarkable artist who just painted all these things from the Lumba onwards. So those things become really very important. Um, my, my, only, my second thing is very quickly is that I, um, I, I hesitate around pleasure because I think that the question for community and the question of the social is really about happiness. Um, and, they, and that I would want, not want to counterpose pleasure and happiness, but want us to, would want us to think through what is the meaning of happiness um, in relationship to questions of the social and of, of the community. I think this is really very important because I think one of the things that happens to us under neoliberalism is we ourselves get saturated in ways that we don't even quite understand. Right? And that, that set that, and that to think through the social question to me is still extraordinarily important in a climate and in a world in which the individual is seen as the prime unit, in which the heart of neoliberalism is that there is no society. And therefore, if there is no society and we are just all individuals running around the place, then there is no such a connection to us. To think about community, if you're an artist, is to think about a tradition. There is no, there is a community that you work with, obviously, but you don't paint without not working within a tradition. You don't do music without not working in a tradition. And that, that tradition also becomes your community. Right? And one of the things that I think is important to understand um, in, 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 black, in black life is that there is a way in which people have, I think, organized what I like to call a certain historical amnesia about what those traditions and what those communities are. And that you find certainly among us here that we understand them and we can talk about them. But if you go elsewhere to sit down and to try and talk to people about these things, you have to start from square one. And it's not because people are silly, people are absolutely bright and geniuses. But the question is, what is how is it that power has operated, imperial power has operated to create blocks of amnesia so that people think that they are disconnected from a certain tradition and to try and replace that tradition by a, by a set of other things. So I, I would want to put frame, reframe these things a little bit differently um, because, I think they, because I think we are a very, let me just put it put plainly. I think we're of the species, the human species is that a very funny place. I can't think of any other time in human history. And it's not just about living in the United States. I can't think about any other time in human history in which we are at a particular stage where if we don't grapple with certain things that have to do with the questions of the social and ourselves, then we are into a set of troubles. Somebody wanna have a go at this young brother's first question? 
Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, can we just answer yeah. one question really just, quickly, Dina? Yeah. yeah, just real quick, my man. Um, I think, you know, I work with young artists all the time. I think part of it is you have to give people a touchstone, you know, something tangible to hold on to, something that they can relate to, and then you could take them anywhere. You know what I mean? Really, but you have, like, you gain the trust of your audience or your viewership or your readership by just, you know, holding out something for them to grasp on, and then you could take them where you take them, you know? Um, I'm Dorian. Um, right, I wanted to respond specifically to this idea of um, engaging with pleasure without sort of like, I don't know, um, maybe push back on this idea of like pretending you're in a world where you can like just grab the lip gloss and the glossy magazines. Um, because like necessarily like the things that we find pleasurable are informed by power and like who's in power and our desires are informed by power. So like whether or not it gives me pleasure to like buy a glossy magazine with like a thin blonde white woman on every single page, I'm internalizing my own inferiority and like it's giving me pleasure, but like what does it mean if I'm not critical about that pleasure? And so I guess I was wondering if y'all could expand on um, critically engaging with your own aesthetic and what you find beautiful. How much can you do that before you deconstruct what you find pleasurable? Um, and how much do you need to do that to still see yourself as like a human in a world where there's white supremacy and misogyny and transphobia and all this? Yeah, um, great. Thank you. One of, thank you so much for that question. I think it's so important. Why don't we stay on that question um, and yeah, I just want to pass it. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that we should live in fantasy worlds. I mean, I know that I say that theater can offer us an ideal world to live in for a while, and I believe that, but it not that to me, what's in a glossy magazine or even a glossy lip is not to me the ideal world. The point I'm trying to make is that I think that uh, sometimes we do need a balm, and I think it is important to be critical and ask questions about why we have inherited this idea that this is what is pleasurable, even going back to the, sort of the question of are, is pleasure only sexual, and what do we find beautiful, and who is beautiful? So an, under no circumstances would I argue that we not be critical, but I also think that um, it is important sometimes to find a way to take care of yourself immediately, right? Um, and um, over time, those immediate needs and those immediate ways of taking care of yourself can change and should change. But I think that we, um, this is not the self-care panel, um, but I don't know <laughs> that we often think about self-care, which I think art is one way that we can do that. You know, I, I talked about one of the things theater can do is offer us a space to play, to be together, maybe just to touch each other in a way that's not sexual and not violent. How often do we find those spaces in our lives? So yeah, I absolutely agree. Let's have a critical frame work on that and I didn't mean to imply kind of cheekily that those things are not important to me um, but just to point out that um, you know for me like a lip gloss was a crutch at a time um, that I really needed something immediately to not literally like lose my mind. I was in so much pain and hurt um, with no place to put that. I mean, this is what um, not-for-profits do to us, right? They use you up. Um, they'll take all your labor <laughs> until you're too tired to keep doing it. Um, and so much of our organizing strategy has um, kind of been co-opted by a not-for-profit model that doesn't have self-care, that doesn't have individual or community at its core. And so as we're trying to find and rediscover ways of organizing, we also have to take care of ourselves, both in the immediate, what that looks like, in the least hurtful way you can find, and then, yes, in the long term, transform what you think is pleasurable, what you think is beautiful. Okay, we're sort of running out of time. Just to yeah. Really quickly, just to say, you know, just from hearing everybody um, speak, that it's, a part of what I'm getting is that you know, expressive culture is a site of contestation. It's a space where um, there is a possibility for resistance, but also the reiteration of all these dominant scripts that we're trying to dismantle, as people have said. But that we should also be careful to think that art and aesthetics is the place that we get to teleport to a world that does not yet exist, maybe only in one's mind, right? In that decolonized mind. And I think the way that Robin Kelly talks about in Freedom Dreams about, you know, going to a place that only exists in one's imagination is part of the power of holding on to the, the, 
the power of pleasure in collective political struggle, but also in art making that doesn't necessarily um, mandate a prescription or um, a clear one-to-one -one mapping between what the art should look like and what the revolution is supposed to look like. That disconnect, that disjuncture, even the disjuncture with the translation that we're all experiencing up here um, sonically as we're trying to speak to you, that disjuncture is, is I think, why art is special and what's something that we should value. So. I'd also like to say, you know, to the, um, to the sister that, I mean, you, you made me think of too of the, the documentary that I'm working on now um, that will be called Treasure. It was called Transparent as a working title. And um, we really began looking at the murder of a, a 19 year old um, girl in Detroit, a transgender girl. Um, and I didn't want to just focus, be another one of those documentaries that fetishized violence, that just looked at trans bodies when they were corpses. Um, and I was lucky enough to live in Detroit and to be in a community where there were all these young trans women inspired by Shelley's murder who were doing this amazing work around trans justice. And when I began to train my lens on them, I saw something incredibly beautiful, like inside and out. Um, and one of them recently articulated, and, and then, you, you know, as we're doing this work, there are three or four documentaries that are happening. Um, Janet Ma comes out with her amazing book. Uh, my friend Gina Rosero um, comes out as a trans woman. And th then there became this idea of, like, beauty and, like, kind of Janet Mock being, say, the Lena Horn of, of the trans kind of, you know, movement being, um, you know, the idea of passing um, for a woman and, and being not visibly trans. And the women that I'm film working with in Detroit are absolutely visibly trans and are absolutely um, saying that there is power in that visibility, um, that they're not interested in so-called passing, that they're absolutely invested in their visibility as trans women. And, and that wasn't even something that was a part of the plan, say with the film, even with the, doc, with the video. It wasn't like I said, oh, let me find a bunch of beautiful, you know, women of all hues, black women of all hues with natural hair. The satisfaction casted the people in their community. The, the group itself casted the people in their community. And the, the gathering of those women became resistance itself. And the fact that, you know, my intention, one is, intention was that the space would remain all female, um, you know, therefore, th that was intentional, and that was the resistance, and that they would enjoy one another, and that was the pleasure. Um, but I am thinking about how sometimes these things just happen, but they don't just happen. They come because we as artists approach these projects with all of the information that we have. Thanks, Dream. Um, yeah. All right, we have time for one last question. I'm sorry, I know we have to continue this conversation at the party later tonight, but uh, here's one last question. Uh, I have a question for basically during now uh, the graffiti artist. I'm sorry, so I forgot your name, man, but it was a dope presentation you did. Thanks, I'm not a graffiti artist, so, but I fucks with graffiti. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the professor at the end, um, my name is Brandon, I'm from Memphis, and um, one of the main things I do as far as social activism is uh, campus work and justice campaigns. And um, I'm with a group known as United Students Against Swiss Ops. I'm a part of their organization. And uh, we had a boot camp in Memphis like last year. And um, one of the, the biggest things about the whole thing is how like, all cultures together was um, we go to hip hop show like um, during the weekend of the event. Um, so my question is, what do you think uh, Hip hop artistry brings to the movement because, in my opinion, um, a hip hop is revolutionary because they they state their message and if it's, it doesn't have to be politicized, it's actually you know stepping out, representing their community, representing their background, um, representing their culture without having anything commercialized, um, watered down, or anything like that. So anybody can answer. Me. I think you gave your answer too, but yeah, does, anybody, right, right. <laughs> does anybody want yes. to? Yeah. Does anybody want to throw in besides saying yes, Mark? I, I don't think hip hop is revolutionary. Or not. <laughs> oh, and then you just <laughs> damn me. Just gonna put the mic in my. <laughs> I, I think we're hard pressed 
we, we want the art to be revolutionary, but all the art is not going to be revolutionary. And all the artists aren't. You know, we shouldn't expect hip hop artists to be any more revolutionary than we would have expected Bobby Blue Bland or, or someone like that to be. You know, there are artists who are committed to the movement. Um, even when we talk about the civil rights movement in, in this kind of revisionist sense, I mean, it wasn't like there was 90% of the people who had their hand in the movement. There were people that were in the movement and that number never reflected the totality of the community. What we can only expect, I think, from artists is that they just be honest to themselves and who they are and what their work is. Um, you know, if you're Jay-Z and you sold drugs, you, you can be honest with that, right? And, and we have the capacity in terms of our analysis to be able to push back and critique and offer some sort of response to that, right? Because the artists don't, the artists don't function in a vacuum, right? The artists function in the context of a community that encourages, that pushes back, that admonishes. We also have to be serious about developing a kind of critical or getting back to a critical intelligence here. Right? I mean, this is a part about like Baraka's career. We think about Baraka as the artist, but we don't talk enough about Baraka, the music journalist and, criticism, and critic, that created, basically, there's no Trisha Rose's black noise without Baraka's blues people, right? And you had a whole generation of folks who came through that understood it as critics. It wasn't about making sure that you, and you know, Dream knows something about this, because she came through that early moment and vibe in these other magazines where it was about the art and not about whether or not you were going to get an invitation you know, to the after party. Or it wasn't a celebrity piece or a lifestyle piece about what was going on, but people actually writing criticism about the art. You'd be hard pressed to find any place in mainstream America where folks are writing actual criticism of recorded music <laughs> in mainstream venues. And if you do things like blogs, what you know is that you might do this work and that work might be like 2,000, 3,000 words and ain't nobody gonna read it. Right? What they want to read is your list of the seven great Marvin Gaye songs. Right? That'll get you 50,000 hits. An actual critique of what's going on, that'll get you 750. <laughs> All right. All right. Please join me in thanking the panelists, and we'll party tonight. <laughs>